Minister said in answer to question in his question time answer on the subject of Ian Taylor was to totally disassociate himself from it. Totally. So I don't quite know what the point so I don't quite know what the point was that the honourable member was trying to say. But as it happens, the Prime Minister needn't have said that about Ian Taylor. And he needn't have uh, uh, and if he had had the information, of course, at the uh, beginning of his speech at the end, uh, he would have been able to point out several things. He did so very briefly. This censure motion, this censure motion is based on a suggestion that the leader of the Labor Party in Western Australia uh, knowingly, off his own bat, went out there and invited the Australian Heritage Foundation to meet with him. And we, are, we have from the leader of the opposition a conjured up image of the serried ranks of the front bench of the opposition in Western Australia seeking their personal meeting with the League of Rights front organisation in Western Australia so they could change, exchange vows and views. What it was was this. An invitation went out to 980 organisations in the Helena region. It was put out, of course, by the, the secretary of, uh, of the campaign organisation associated with it. In addition, Order. The light, it, was, it was augmented. Order. It was augmented. Order. By a, and, and this apparently the Australian Heritage Society was included within 103 names provided from InfoLink in the Alexander Library as organisations that uh, had uh, uh, associations in the Helena region, and they sent it out. So this is an, uh, this is an invitation that went out to a thousand organisations. That's the first point I'd make. Well, we now know how. We now know how the invitation ended up in the hands of the League of Rights. We know that. What we do not know is how the League of Rights invitation ended up in the hands of the Liberal Party. Now, isn't that an interesting thing to conjure with? Isn't that an interesting thing to think about? As to how that may have occurred. That's the first point. And the second point is, the second point is, of course, in the invitation that went out to the Heritage Society, the invitation to the Heritage Society did not, did not go out on the letterhead of the West Australian branch of the Heritage Society. So we ask ourselves, how did the letterhead of the West Australian branch of the Heritage Society end up in the hands of the Liberal tacticians? Now, these are very interesting questions to conjure with. Because what it says, of course, is that for somebody in the West Australian Liberal Party, there is a lockstep relationship with the League of Rights. <laughs> and just as the Leader of the Opposition, unknowingly, he says to himself, and, and unfortunately for him, has been earning money for the League of Rights for the last seven years as they've retailed his video, <laughs> just as there's people who have benefited from that particular link in South Australia. There is clearly somebody in the West Australian Liberal Party who feels as though they benefit from this particular relationship with the League of Rights in Western Australia. So that's the first point that we'd want to make uh, in answer to these propositions. The second point is this. The Leader of the Opposition likes to portray his troubles this week, and they have been many and varied, as a product as a product of the devilishness of the Australian Prime Minister. The sleeping and waking thoughts of the Australian Prime Minister is how can I invent yet something else that will slip a torpedo into Alexander? Now, it is a feature of Alexander's self-obsession that he arrives at this conclusion. But again, of course, his self-obsession doesn't relate exactly to the truth. Now, it's pretty well known about the place that the material that ended up in Laurie Oakes's hands came at some, at some point around the place from the Liberal Party. And quite clearly what he is being subject to is a destabilisation from that section of the Liberal Party, who clearly has no truck with the League of Rights, as opposed to the other section of the, legal part, of the Liberal Party that receives correspondence from the League of Rights and passes them across to the Liberal Party front bench team here. So that's the second interesting feature of this. And it's not surprising that you should be being stabilised in, destabilised in that way, because what has happened to you is a reflection of the way in which you conduct yourself in public life and the way in which you treat your colleagues. I mean, you represent the most effective cartoon this week of you is not a cartoon about the Leader of the Opposition as a racist, an accusation that's never been in fact levelled at him, 
by people in Australian politics. It is a cartoon of the Leader of the Opposition as a cushion, representing the last backside that sat upon him. <laughs> the last backside that sat upon him that might advance his interests. That is the, that is the most effective cartoon related uh, to, uh, uh, about the Leader of the Opposition as, uh, as far as the, as the presentations this week have, have been concerned. The second thing uh, you'd want to point out about that, about the Leader of the Opposition's habits, is this. The Leader of the Opposition is a terrific perpetrator in his party of this. How you get some of the most rotten people in your show running for you without directly associating with you? How do you do that? It's, a, it's a, his version of statesmanship. You get out there, every rat bag element in your show, use them to destroy your opponents, be close to them, have little chats with them, occasionally wrap them over the knuckles, but in no circumstances repudiate them. In no circumstances repudiate them. And weren't you nicely picked up? Uh, we also get other transcripts from Western Australia. Weren't you nicely picked up by Howard Sattler this morning when he asked you uh, a question or two about your about your treatment by uh, about about your treatment by the media over the last little while? And this is what you had to say in defence of yourself and your little performance with the League of Rights. If I had known that years and years later. Instead of being a backbencher, I was going to be the leader of the opposition and the Labor Party was going to run a smear campaign, aided and abetted by some of your colleagues in the media, run a smear campaign like that, of course, I would have looked at things very differently. <laughs> if, I thought I was going, if I thought I was actually going to be in high office, I would never have attended the League of Rights uh, meeting. But of course, if I hadn't assumed that, I would have done exactly what I did <laughs> at that point of time. And Eric Butler has been spending a considerable amount of time, if you haven't noticed, over the last couple of days, pointing out that he is an honoured, uh, frequent converser with your family, and that, of course, you knew exactly what it was you were attending, and, of course, you had a talk, and, of course, you had a chat with him at the course of that meeting. And, uh, and that is, well, it may not be true, but it's what he said. It may not be true, but it is what he said. So sue him. Sue him. He didn't say it in this place, he said it out there, sue him. That's the, that's the position that you have an opportunity, you have an opportunity to get out there and sue him, do it. And don't, don't muck around in here and try, how arguing with us whether or not Eric Butler is telling the truth about his relationships with you and his attendance at that meeting. Go out there and deal with him yourself. Because that is what he says unrepudiated by you. Another feature of your particular performance in this regard is your double standards. Your double standards in relation to the way in which you treat people in your organisation. And uh, Howard Sattler was on to you again on that subject. And Sattler said yeah, this uh, about your sacking of your predecessor from the front bench for what most people would regard as mild peccadilloes. He said this. Yeah, but some people look at him being kicked off the front bench and Chris Miles being left on it and say, hang on, this is an indication that Alexander Downer, it perhaps is an extreme white right-wing conservative have extreme right-wing conservative views. Well, you know what is wrong, you know that they are totally wrong, says Dan. Well, why didn't you kick out Chris Miles out then? In fact, it's an absolutely disgusting thing to say that I'm somebody with extreme right-wing views. Anybody who knows me knows that I'm the most reasonable and decent sort of person. <laughs> you can read all of You can read all of my record, Howard. You can read all of my record and nowhere on my record will you find that I'm a purveyor of extreme far-right-wing views. And I can tell you, I can tell you, I won't sit idly by without putting up a fight for that, with, for that sort of smear and a new end. Don't stamp. No. <laughs> I will not put up with it. Stamp. <laughs> that is the performance of the leader of the opposition Order. as he sits down and has a chat Order. with, uh, with, uh, the, uh, with the, uh, his, his, uh, his people on the other side. And, I, and he go, and Sattler goes, and I mean you have extremists in your party. People on your front bench like Chris Miles, who runs around the place drumming up at anti-sodomist rallies. And I mean, you support him, don't you? And then this is what Alexander says to an invitation to support the front bencher who survived. I don't support everybody in the Liberal Party. <laughs> Watch out, Chris. Watch out. You're next on the list for a chop. Well, he's on your front bench. I mean, you didn't kick him off the front bench like you kicked off John Hewson from the front bench. 
Uh, I, I don't necessarily have a great deal of time for Howard Sattler, but I suppose that was the obvious question to ask <laughs> when, that, when that was presented. Having just said that he didn't support everything that members of the Liberal Party said, he says, I make the judgments about those sorts of things, but as far as the Liberal Party is concerned, there is obviously a breadth of views in the Liberal Party, and as not everybody in the Liberal Party agrees with you, that doesn't mean that they are subject to pillory, only if they're John Hewson. That's right. That's right. For John Hewson, they're subject to pillory, oh, the but if they're Chris Miles, by they're their put titles. up. Because this has been your record in the South Australian Liberal Party. This has been your record in the South Australian Liberal Party over the last decade. You get up there with the moderates and you kick them to death in all the party functions that you get to. But then you say, it wasn't me who did it. It was really all those right-wing uglies like Minchin and the others. They're the ones who are really after you. I am, a, I am a softening influence. I am a softening influence on their behaviour. I am merely the greasy sort of bottom fish who hangs around waiting for the crumbs to fall off the savaging of the sharks of the poor minnows on the Liberal Party left in South Australia and I feed on the bottom and feeding on the bottom has put me on the top as far as the Liberal Party is concerned in dealing with the moderates. And that is why you find yourself in the trouble in which you, in which you find yourself. Because unfortunately in national politics there are very good sonar mechanisms. And we pick up the greedy little bottom fish that hang around waiting for the, uh, the skerricks that fall out of the uh, savaging of the sharks and we know who benefits. And there are a few people in the media who know who benefit too. And those people in the media from time to time are inclined to draw that to public attention and say one or two things about it. And uh, when they say one or two things about it, what they get from you of course is a stamped foot and, uh, and a little peroration on how it wasn't you. Well, I know something of the college that you were educated in, I know why you're like that. It is the classic mechanism of a bully defending against a superior bully. <laughs> when you've got an inferior bully, when you've got an inferior person before you, like somebody weak like your former leader, you know exactly what you do. When you have a superior bully, like the right-wing uglies in your organisation, you actually know what to do too. Oh no, Ponsonby, I didn't say that. That was Glenna Hassett Smythe. I couldn't have possibly said that. Oh no, Glenna Hassett Smythe. I didn't say that. Ponsonby may tell you that I told Ponsonby that, but it wasn't him, it was Wellesley. Wellesley was the person who told me that. Not, not, uh, not uh, Ponsonby. Don't beat me, please, Wellesley. It had nothing to do with me at all. It was Glenna Hassett Smythe, or perhaps even it was Ponsonby, but it wasn't me. <laughs> You can never find, you can never find the origins of Alexander. <coughs> that is one of the real problems of Alexander's view. They are not there. Black is white as far as Alexander is concerned in his public presentation. Black is white. I say one thing and somebody else says another thing, but I didn't say that. But when I'm well, out, I am put upon. I was put upon. I was put upon that spot. Not because I enjoyed it. I was put upon to support foreign investment because I was employed by the Chamber of Manufacturers. I was put upon by the Liberal Party to oppose foreign investment because our public opinion survey said that I ought to evade that. I was put upon by the West Australian Liberals to say that I opposed the uh, Mabo legislation and would repeal it when I got back into office. And when I come over here, well, really, I had nothing to do that at all because I want to be able to isolate myself in little pockets as to where I appear around the country. Now, it is no accident that when confronted by somebody like yourself, that there are occasions from time to time when your views might be misunderstood. Right-thinking people in the public who see contrary views are likely to interpret them in contrary ways. But as far as this place is concerned, you must be the first leader of the opposition that has had a major West Australian daily say in its editorial after you have led the opposition for 100 days that you preside over a party which is disintegrating. Yeah. A great political force under your care which has fallen apart. That was the verdict of the Sydney Daily Telegraph about your leadership before this week began and they ought not to be in a position where they're obliged to revise their judgement at the end of it. What a stupid tactic. What a stupid tactic to get up a round-robin letter 
sent out by the Leader of the Opposition in Western Australia expose the fact that you receive information from the League of Rights as a result of it, oh, you are worthy of oh, the censure no, motion that has been put upon time. you. Minister's time has expired. That was a recording of Thursday's proceedings from the House of Representatives. Wales Premier Nick Greiner, plus leading social researcher Hugh McKay. But first, Eleanor Hall reports on the things that matter. I have to report to you uh, that two people stood for the leadership, John Newson and Alexander Downer. Alexander Downer received 43 votes. 